between me setting it up and now my video went away okay well this is how we sort this out there it is there we go okay you know what it's been a day uh, it's generally not a good day. Uh, my grandma's in the hospital. She's very far away. It's October 7th, which is also not a good day. So, um, let's, let's get spinning done. I had the battery on. Why is nothing working today? Like, why is just nothing... Nothing working today. Okay. Because the battery has decided that it is done. Okay. Fine battery. I I hear you. I understand. But you do not wish to be batterying. And therefore we need to use actual power. professional here. Of course, of course. <sighs> Pardon me while I, you know, well okay great so yeah it's october 7th and my grandma's in the hospital so we're having that kind of day okay feed in there so that i can so i'm starting i'm gonna stop it momentarily because i need to turn my level winder on but I don't like turning it on before I've got like fiber on the bobbin because just I don't know you know what I don't even know why so when last we spun together um, I was trying to do a fractal 
um, of the multicolor braid of this. So I split it, I split it completely in half. I weighed it, so it was actually like pretty much half by weight. And then I split half of it into three, and then I spun them all. So the single, which was half a bobbin, was like one length, and the other half, just split in three, spun sequentially, was like, I don't know, double the amount on the bobbin? Who knows? Anyway, I plied it together, um, and then, like, the extra I, uh... God, who's calling me and why? The extra I just, um, uh, chain bound, like normal. So this is what the, fir the first of the two complementary colors that go with that. That's drying currently in my bathroom, or I would be showing you. Um, so this is the brown one, which I think is maybe just called Buffalo. I know the other one is called Something Sky, because it's all blue. So uh, because the blue and the brown look actually pretty good plied together from the, the big braid, I am actually going to just just apply the two together. I'm just gonna apply the brown and the brown and the the blue together into um, one thing. So that's gonna be interesting. Meanwhile, I had uh, the previous thing that we applied. If you remember, I had split the the big color and applied half of it with green and half of it with blue. I knit something out of it, so that came out pretty good, but then I had like half of it left over. Seriously? Ugh. I hate when these things break. Because I have to find like where it broke. Where does it break? Where is your end? That's the problem, right? Is finding finding the the end bit. I feel like. Oh, I'm also. Oh, you know what? Everything about this is terrible. We're gonna just. We're gonna take this off. We're gonna respin it. Because I spun it in the ply direction because I'm stupid. Because I got distracted by the power not working i think so this is an exercise in nonsense is what this is an exercise in nonsense i don't even remember what i was talking about before i realized that i was applying this instead of oh yeah so i took the the leftover you know, plied with green, plied with blue. And, uh... Okay, where's your end here? And I put it together. So it's a four-ply, um, but it looks real good together. Like, it's, it's just, it just looks really nice. So I am happy about that. Alright, did I now switch it to spin and not to ply? Yeah. Now, because guess what I was doing last on this? Plying. Guess what I didn't do? Change it. Oh my god. Thread. F you. This is also why I don't turn the level winder on first, because then it's just much easier to find where the heck the end went. This is going to be a disaster to respin, so we're gonna spin it into. Um, we're just gonna spin it into a long side of this because that is gonna be easier, I think. Get on the bobbin and stay there. Can't be that hard. Why did we, why did we switch away, put away, 
idea. I have no idea what is going on anymore. Anywhere. I guess this is almost like applying since that pre-done single is um, done in the wrong direction. But such is life. Just trying to feed it in there so that it kind of stays together and spins up and it'll come out in the wash, literally. It's all going in the right direction, question mark. Don't actually know. We'll find out. <laughs> At least it's not like switched to some weird other view for no good reason. I don't know what was going on there, like at all. like my scenes switched for nothing no button presses no nothing got all of the previously backwards spun stuff on there. So let's see if we can get more of this stuff. I am hoping to read more Iliad today. So I think last time we read the Iliad, which was a while ago, uh, we read book four. So let me just move my place where I'm monitoring everything over and we're gonna read book five um, which tells us that it is the exploits of Diomed who though wounded by Pandarus continues fighting he kills Pandarus and wounds, Aene wounds Aeneas Venus rescues Aeneas but being wounded by Diomed commits him to the care of Apollo and goes to Olympus where she is tended by her mother Dion Mars encourages the Trojans and the and Aeneas returns to the fight, cured of his wound. Minerva and Juno help with the Chians, and by the advice of the former Diomed wounds Mars, who returns to Olympus to get cured. Okay. Let me just say that none of that made sense, but that's okay. We are describing a war, it's being warlike. Then the palace Minerva put valor into the heart of Diomed, son of Tydeus, that he might excel all the other Argives and cover himself with glory. She made a stream of fire flare from his shield and helmet like the star that shines most brightly in summer after its bath in the waters of Oceanus. 
even such a fire did she kindle upon his head and shoulders as she bade him speed into the thickest hurly-burly of the fight. Now there is a certain rich and honorable man among the Trojans, priest of Vulcan, and his name was Darius. He had two sons, Phagius and Aideus, both of them skilled in all the arts of war. Those two came forward from the main body of Trojans and set upon Diomed, he being on foot, while they fought from their chariot. When they were close up to one another, Phagius took aim first, but his spear went over Diomed's left shoulder without hitting him. Diomed then threw and threw, and his spear sped not in vain, for it hit Phagius on the breast near the nipple, and he fell from his chariot. Aideus did not dare to bestride his brother's body, but sprang from the chariot and took to fight, or he would have shared his brother's fate. Whereon Vulcan saved him by wrapping him in a cloud of darkness, that his old father might not be utterly overwhelmed with grief. But the son of Tides drove off with the horses, and bade his followers take them to the ships. The Trojans were scared when they saw the two sons of Darius, one of them in fright, and the other lying dead by his chariot. Minerva, therefore, took Mars by the hand and said, Mars, Mars, bane of men! blood-stained stormer of cities may we not now leave the trojans and achaeans to fight it out and see to which of the two jove will vouchsafe the victory let us go away and thus avoid his anger you are going too fast here uh, I can just go away. so saying she drew mars out of the battle and set him down upon the steep banks of the scamander upon this the Danans drove the Trojans back, and each one of their chieftains killed his man. First, King Agamemnon flung mighty Odeus, captain of the Halizoni, from his chariot. The spear of Agamemnon caught him on the broad of his back, just as he was turning in flight. It struck him between the shoulders and went right through his chest, and his armor rang rattling around him as he fell heavily to the ground. The Idomeneus killed Phasius, son of Boris the Minoan, who had come from Varn. Mighty Idomeneus spared him on the right shoulder as he was mounting his chariot, and the darkness of death enshrouded him as he fell heavily from the car. The squires of Idomeneus spoiled him of his armor, while Menelaus, son of Atreus, killed Sc Scamandrius, the son of Strophius, a mighty huntsman and keen lover of the chase. Diana herself had taught him how to kill every kind of wild creature that is bred in mountain forests, but neither she nor her famed skill in archery could now save him, for the spear of Menelaus struck him in the back as he was flying. It struck him between the shoulders and went right through his, to his chest, so that he fell headlong and his armor rang rattling around him. Okay. Didn't that just sound... Yes, that was the same description as the previous guy. Okay. Meriones then killed Phereclus, the son of Tecton, who was the son of Hermon, a man whose hand was skilled in all manner of cunning workmanship, for Pallas Minerva had dearly loved him. He it was that made the ships for Alexandrus, which were the beginning of all mischief, and brought evil alike both to the Trojans and on Alexandrus himself, for he heeded not the decrees of heaven. Meriones overtook him as he was flying, and struck him on the right buttock. The point of the spear went through the bone into the bladder, and death came upon him as he cried aloud and fell forward on his knees. Medges, moreover, slew Piteus, son of Antenor, who, though he was a bastard, had been brought up by Theano as one of her own children for the love she bore her husband. I should create a raft to this or something. Anyway. Uh, the son of Phileas got close up to him and drove a spear into the nape of his neck. It went under his tongue and all among his teeth, so he bit the cold bronze and fell dead in the dust. And Eurypylus, son of Euamon, killed Hepsinor, the son of noble Dolopian, who had been made priest of the river's commander and was honored among the people as though he were a god. 
Eurypylus gave him chase as he was flying before him, smote him with his sword upon the arm, and loped the strong hand from it. The bloody hand fell to the ground, and the shades of death, with fate that no man could withstand, came over his eyes. Thus furiously did the battle rage between them. As for the son of Tydeus, you could not say whether he was more among the Archaeans or the Trojans. He rushed across the plain like a winter torrent that had burst its barriers in full flood. No dikes, no walls of fruitful vineyards can embark it when it is swollen with rain from heaven, but in a moment it came tearing onward, and lays many a field waste that many a strong man's hand has reclaimed. Even so, were the dense phalanxes of the Trojans driven in rout by the son of Tydeus, and many though they were, they dared not abide his onslaught. Now, when the son of Lycaon saw him scouring the plain and driving the Trojans hell-mell before him, he aimed an arrow and hit the front part of his cuirass near the shoulder. The arrow went right through the metal and pierced the flesh, so that the cuirass was covered with blood. On this, the son of Lycaon shouted in triumph, Knights Trojans, come on, the bravest of the Achaeans is wounded, and he will not hold out much longer if King Apollo was indeed with me when I sped from Lycia hither. Thus did he vaunt, but his arrow had not killed Diomed, who withdrew and made for the chariot and horses of Sthenelus, the son of Capaneus. Dear son of Capaneus, said he, come down from your chariot and draw the arrow out of my shoulder. Sthenelus sprang from his chariot and drew the arrow from the wound, whereupon the blood came spouting out through the hole that had been made in his shirt. Then Diomed prayed, saying, Hear me, daughter of Aegis-bearing Jove, unweariable, if ever you loved my father well and stood by him in the thick of a fight, do the like now by me, grant me to come within a spear's throw of the man and kill him. He has been too quick for me and has wounded me, and now he is boasting that I shall not see the light of the sun much longer. Thus he prayed, and Pallas and Nerva heard him. She made his limbs subtle, supple and quickened his hands and his feet. Then she went up close to him and said, Fear not, Diomed, to do battle with the Trojans, for I have set in your heart the spirit of your knightly father Tydeus. Moreover, I have withdrawn the veil from your eyes, that you know gods and men apart. If, then, any other god comes here and offers you battle, do not fight him. But should Jove's daughter Venus come, strike her with your spear and wound her. When she had said this, Minerva went away, and the son of Titus again took his place among the foremost fighters, three times more fierce even than he had been before. He was like a lion that came some mountain shepherd had wounded, but not killed, as he is springing over the wall of the sheepyard to attack the sheep. The shepherd had roused the brute to fury, but cannot defend his flock, so he takes shelter under cover of the buildings, while the sheep, panic-stricken on being deserted, are smothered in heaps, one on top of another, and the angry lion leaps out over the sheepyard wall. Even thus the Diomed go furiously about among the Trojans. He killed Astinus and Hyperion, shepherd of his people, the one with a thrust of his spear which struck him above the nipple, and the other with the sword cut on the collarbone that severed his shoulder from his neck and back. He let both of them lie and went in pursuit of Abbas and Polydeus, son of the old reader of dreams Eurydamus. They never came back for him to read them any more dreams, for mighty Diomed made an end of them. He then gave chase to Xanthus and Thune, the two sons of Phanops, both of them very dear to him, for he was now worn out with age and begat no more sons to inherit his possessions. But Diomed took both their lives and left their father sorrowing bitterly, for he never more saw them come home from battle alive, and his kinsmen divided his wealth amongst themselves. Then he came upon two sons of Priam, Echemon and Chromius, as they were both in one chariot. He sprang upon them as a lion fastens on the neck of some cow or heifer when the herd is feeding in a coppice. For all their vain struggles, he flung them both from the chariot and stripped the armor from their bodies. 
Then he gave their horses to his comrades to take them back to the ships. When Aeneas saw him thus making havoc among the ranks, he went through the fight among the rain of spears to see if he could find Pandarus. When he had found the brave son of Lycon, he said, Pandarus, where is now your bow, your winged arrows, and your renown as an archer, in respect of which no man here can rival you, nor is there any in Lycia that can beat you? Lift then your hands to Jove and send an arrow at this fellow who is going to masterfully about and has done such deadly work among the Trojans. He has killed many a brave man, unless indeed he is some god who is angry with the Trojans about their sacrifices and has set their hands against them in his displeasure. And the son of Lycon answered, Aeneas, I take him for none other than the son of Tydeus. I know him by his shield, the visor of his helmet, and by his horses. It is possible that he may be a god, but if he is the man I say he is, he is not making all this havoc without heaven's help, but as some god by his side, who is shrouded in a cloud of darkness, and who turned my arrow aside when it had hit him. I have taken aim at him already, and hit him on the right shoulder. My arrow went through the breastpiece of his cuirass, and I made sure I should send him hurrying to the world below, but it seems I, I have not killed him. There must be a god who is angry with me. Moreover, I have neither horse nor chariot. In my father's stables, there are eleven excellent chariots, fresh from the builder, quite new, with cloths spread over them, and by each of them there stand a pair of horses, champing barley and rye. My old father, Lycon, urged me again and again when I was at home and on the point of starting to take chariots and horses with me, that I might lead the Trojans in battle. But I would not listen to him. It would have been much better if I had done so. But I was thinking about the horses, which had been used to eat their fill, and I was afraid that in such a great gathering of men they might be ill-fed. So I left them at home and came on foot to Ilias, armed only with my bow and arrows. These, it seems, are of no use, for I have already hid, hit two chieftains, the sons of Atreus and of Tydeus, and though I drew blood, surely enough, I have only made them still more furious. I did ill to take my bow down from the peg on the day I led my band of Trojans to Ilias in Hector's service, and if ever I get home again to set eyes on my native place, my wife, and the greatness of my house, may someone cut my head off then and there if I do not break the bow and set it not on a hot fire, such pranks as it plays me. Aeneans answered, say no more. Things will not mend till we too go against this man with chariot and horses and bring him to a trial of arms. Mount my chariot and note how cleverly the horses of Tros can speed hither and thither over the plains in pursuit of our flight. If Jove again vouchsafes glory to the son of Tydeus, they will carry us safely back to the city. Take hold then of the whip and reins while I stand upon the car to fight, or else do you wait this man's onset while I look after the horses? Aeneas, replied the son of Lycaon, take the reins and drive. If we have to fly before the son of Tydeus, the horses will go better for their own driver. If they miss the sound of your voice when they expect it, they may be frightened and refuse to take us out of the fight. The son of Tydeus will then kill both of us and take the horses. Therefore drive them yourself and I will be ready for him with my spear. They then mounted the chariot and drove full speed towards the son of Tydeus. Senelus, son of Capenius, saw them coming and said to Diomed, Diomed, son of Tydeus, man after my own heart, I see two heroes speeding towards you, both of them men of might, and the one is skilled archer, Pandarus, son of Lycian, and the other Aeneas, whose sire is Anchises, whose mother is Venus. Mount the chariot and let us retreat. I do not pray you press so furiously forward, or you may get killed. Diomed looked angrily at him and answered, Talk not of flight, for I shall not listen to you. I am of a race that knows neither flight nor fear, and my limbs are yet unwearied. I am in no mind to mount, but will go against them even as I am. Pallas Minerva bids me be afraid of no man, even even though one of them escape, their steed shall not take both of them again. I say further, and lay, lay my saying to your heart. 
If Minerva sees fit to vouchsafe me the glory of killing both, stay your horses here and make the reins fast to the rim of the chariot. Then be sure you spring Aeneas's horses and drive them from the Trojan to the Achaean ranks. They are of the stock that great Jove gave to Tros in payment for his son Ganymede, and are the finest that live and move under the sun. King Anchises stole the blood by putting his mares to them without Lomedon's knowledge, and they bore him six foals. Four are still in his stables, but he gave the other two to Aeneas. We shall win great glory if we can take them. Thus did they converse, but the other two had now driven close up to them, and the son of Lycian spoke first. Great and mighty son, said he, of noble Tydeus, my arrow failed to lay you low, so I will now try with my spear. He poised his spear as he spoke and hurled it from him. From him. It struck the shield of the son of Tydeus. The bronze point pierced it and passed on till it reached the breastplate. Therion, the son of Lycaon, shouted out and said, You are hit clean through the belly. You will not stand out for long, and the glory of the fight is mine. But Diomed, all undismayed, made answer, You have missed, not hit. And before you two see the end of this matter, one or the other of you shall glut though shielding Mars with his blood. With this he hurled his spear, and Minerva guided it on to Pandarus's nose near the eye. It went crushing in among his white teeth. The bronze point cut through the root of his tongue, coming out under his chin. This is gross coming out under his chin uh, and his glistening armor rang rattling round him as he fell heavily to the ground their armor all like rattles a lot when they fall the horses started aside for fear and he was reft of life and strength Aeneas sprang from his chariot armed with shield and spear fearing lest the Achaeans should carry off the body he bestrode it as a lion in the pride of strength with his shield and spear before him and a cry of battle on his lips resolute to kill the first that should dare face him but the son of titus caught up a mighty stone so huge and great that as men now are it were take two to lift it nevertheless he bore it aloft with ease unaided and with this he struck an ease on the groin where the hip turns to the joint that is called the cup bone the stone crushed this joint wow this is uh, hilarious the stone crushed this joint and broke with the sinews while its jagged edges tore away all the flesh this is fucking this is considered good writing i guess i feel like i'm reading a medical textbook among other things also a really 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 boring like historic battle description uh, blow by blow. I guess they didn't have newspapers, so they had this instead. Uh, okay. The hero fell on his knees and propped himself with his hand resting on the ground. Till the darkness of night fell upon his eyes, and now Aeneas, king of men, would have perished then and there, had not his mother, Jove's daughter Venus, who had conceived him by Achilles when he was herding cattle, been quick to mark and thrown her two white arms around the body of her dear son. She protected him by covering him with the fold of her own fair garment, lest some Danon should drive a spear into his breast and kill him. Thus, then, did she bear her dear son out of the fight. But the son of Capaneus was not unmindful of the orders that Diomed had given him. He made his own horses fast away from the hurly-burly by binding the reins to the rim of the chariot. Then he sprang upon Aeneas's horses and drove them from the Trojan to the Achaean ranks. When he had so done, he gave them over to his chosen comrade Diapolis, whom he valued above all others as the one who was most like-minded with himself, to take them on to the ships. He then remounted his, old char his own chariot, seized the reins, and drove with all speed in search of the son of Tydeus. Now the son of Tydeus was in pursuit of the Cyprian goddess, spear in hand, for he knew her to be feeble and not one of those goddesses that can lord it among men in battle like Minerva or Enyo, the waster of cities. And when at last, after a long chase, he caught her up, 
He flew at her and thrust his spear into the flesh of her delicate hand. The point ran, tore through the ambrosial robe which the graces had woven for her and pierced the skin between her wrist and the palm of her hand so that the mortal blood or ichor that flowed in the veins of the blessed gods came purring from the wound for the gods do not eat bread nor drink wine hence they have no blood such as ours and are immortal venus screamed aloud and let her son fall but phoebus apollo caught him in his arms and hid him in a cloud of darkness lest some denan should drive a spear into his breast and kill him and diomed shouted out as he left her daughter of jove leave war and battle alone can you not be contented with the beguiling silly woman if you meddle with fighting you will get what will make you shudder at the very name of war the goddess went dazed as discomfited away and iris fleet as the wind drew her from the throng in pain and with her fair skin all besmirched she found fierce mars waiting on the left of the battle with his spear and his two fleet steeds resting in a cloud whereupon she fell on her knees before her brother and implored him to let her have his horses dear brother she cried save me and give me your horses to take me to olympus where the gods dwell i am badly wounded by a mortal the son of tydeus who would now fight even with father jove thus she spoke and mars gave her his gold bedazzled steeds the mount she mounted the chariot sick and sorry at heart while iris sat beside her and took the reins in her hands she lashed her horses on and they flew forward not nothing loth till in a trice they were on high olympus where the gods have their dwelling there she stayed them unloosened them from the chariot and gave them their ambrosial forage but venus flung herself on the lap of her mother dion who threw her arm about her and caressed her saying which of the heavenly beings has been treating you in this way as though you had been doing something wrong in the face of day and laughter loving venus answered proud diomed the son of tydeus wounded me because i was bearing my dear son aeneas whom i love best of all mankind out of the fight the war is no longer one between trojans and achaeans for the danans have now taken to fighting with the immortals bear it my child replied dion and make the best of it we dwellers in olympus have to put up with much at the hands of men and we lay much suffering on one another mars had to suffer when otis and ephelatis children of elonius bound him in cruel bonds so that he lay 13 months imprisoned in a vessel of bronze mars would have then perished had not fair eriboa stepmother of the son to the son of aleus told mercury who stole him away when he was already well nigh worn out by the severity of his bondage juno again suffered when the mighty son of amphitryon wounded her on the right breast with a three barbed arrow and nothing could assuage her pain so also did huge hades when this same man the son of ages bearing jove yeah okay apparently we are gonna care but we're making progress which is good and we're making progress in this fluid chapter too which is also good let me just get this back sorted out so that we can Continue. Where were we? Uh, okay. There on Hades went to the house of Jove on great Olympus, angry and full of pain, and the arrow in his brawny shoulder caused him great anguish, till Paeon healed him by spreading soothing herbs on the wound, for Hades was not of mortal wound. Daring, headstrong, evildoer, who wrecked not of who wrecked not of his sin in shooting the gods, 
that dwell on Olympus, and now Minerva has egged the son of Tydeus on against yourself. Fool that he is for not reflecting that no man who fights with gods will live long, or hear his children prattling about his knees when he returns from battle. Let then the son of Tydeus see that he does not have to fight with one who is stronger than you are. Then shall, then sh then shall his brave wife Aegelia, daughter of Aegdrastus, rouse her whole house from sleep, wailing for the loss of her wedded lord Diomed, the bravest of the Achaeans. So saying, she wiped the ichor from the wrist of her daughter with both hands, whereupon the pain left her, and her hand was healed. But Minerva and Juno, who were looking on, began to taunt Jove with their mocking talk, and Minerva was first to speak. Father Jove, said she, do not be angry with me, but I think the Cyprian must have been persuading someone of the Achaean women to go with the Trojans, for whom she is so very fond, and while caressing one or other of them, she must have torn her delicate hand with the gold pin of the woman's brooch. The sire of gods and men smiled and called Golden Venus to his side. My child, said he, it has not been given you to be a warrior. Attend henceforth to your own delightful matrimonial duties and leave all this fighting to Mars and to Minerva. Th thus did they converse. But Diomed sprang upon Aeneas, though he knew him to be in the very arms of Apollo. Not one whit did he fear the mighty god, so set was he on killing Aeneas and stripping him of his armor. Thrice did he spring forward with might and main to slay him, and thrice did Apollo beat back his gleaming shield. When he was coming on for the fourth time, as though he were a god, Apollo shouted to him with an awful voice and said, Take heed, son of Tydeus, and draw off. Think not to match yourself against gods, for men that walk the earth cannot hold their own with the immortals. The son of Tydeus then gave way for a little space to avoid the anger of the god, while Apollo took Aeneas out of the crowd and set him in sacred Pergamus, where his temple stood. There, within the mighty sanctuary, Latona and Diana healed him and made him glorious to behold, while Apollo of the silver bow fashioned a wraith in the likeness of Aeneas, and armed as he was. Round this, the Trojans and Achaeans hacked at the bucklers about one another's breasts, hewing each other's round shields and light hide-covered targets. Then Phoebus Apollo said to Mars, 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 bane of men! Blood-stained stormer of cities, can you not go to this man, the son of Titus, who would now fight even with Father Jove and drove him out of the battle? He first went up to the Cyprian and wounded her in the hand near her wrist, and afterwards sprang upon me too as though he were a god. He then took his seat on the top of Pergamus, while murderous Mars went about among the ranks of the Trojans, cheering them on, in the likeness of fleet Achamus, chief of the Tratians. Sons of Priam, said he, how long will you let your people be thus slaughtered by the Achaeans? Would you wait till they are at the walls of Troy? Aeneas, the son of Achaeses, has fallen, he whom he had in as high honor as Hector himself. Help me then to rescue our brave comrade from the stress of the fight. With these words he put heart and soul into them all. Then Sarpedon rebuked Hector very sternly. Hector, said he, where is your prowess now? You used to say that though you had neither people nor allies, you could hold the town alone with your brothers and brothers-in-law. I see not one of them here. They cower as hounds before a lion. It is we, your allies, who bear the brunt of the battle. I have come from afar, even from Lycia and the banks of the Rio, river Xanthus, where I have left my wife, my infant son, and much wealth to tempt whoever is needy. Nevertheless, I heed my Lycian soldiers and stand my ground against any who would fight me, though I have nothing here for the Achaeans to plunder. While you look on, without even bidding your men stand firm in defense of their wives. See that you fall not into the hands of your foes as men caught in the marshes of a net, and they sack your fair city forthwith. Keep this before your mind night and day, 
and beseech the captains of your allies to hold on without flinching and thus put away their reproaches from you so spoke sarpedon and hector smarted under his words he sprang from his chariot clad in his suit of armor and went about along the host brandishing his two spears exhorting the men to fight and raising the terrible cry of battle then they rallied again and again faced to the achaeans but the argives stood compact and firm and were not driven back as the breezes sport with the chaff upon some goodly thrashing floor when men are winnowing while yellow series flows with the wind to sift the chaff from the grain and the chaff heaps grow wither whiter and whiter even so did the Achaeans whiten in the dust which their horses hoofs raised to the firmament of heaven as their drivers turned them back to battle and they bore down with might upon the foe fierce mars to help the trojans covered them in darkness in the veil of darkness sorry and went about everywhere among them inasmuch as phoebus apollo had told him that when he saw Pallas minerva leave the fray he was to put courage into the hearts of the trojans for it was she who was helping the Danaans. then apollo sent aeneas forth from his rich sanctuary and filled his heart with valor whereupon he took his place among his comrades who were overjoyed at seeing him alive sound and of a good courage but they could not ask him how it had how happened for they were too busy with the turmoil raised by mars and by strife who raged insatiably in their minds the two ajaxes ulysses and diomed cheered the danans on fearless of the fury and onset of the trojans they stood as still as clouds which the son of saturn had spread upon the mountain tops when there is no air and fierce boreas sleeps with the other boisterous winds whose shrill blasts scatter the clouds in all directions even so did the danan stand firm and unflinching against the trojans the son of atreus went among about among them and exhorted them my friends said he quit yourselves like brave men and shun dishonor in one another's eyes and in the stress of battle they then shun dishonor more often more often live than get killed but they that fly save neither life nor name as he spoke he hurled his spear and hit one of those who were in the front rank the comrade of aeneas dicoon son of pergasus whom the trojans held in no less honor than the sons of priam for he was ever quick to place himself among the foremost the spear of king agamemnon struck his shield and went right through it for the shield sta stayed it not it drove through his belt into the lower part of his belly and his armor rang rattling around him as he fell heavily to the ground then aeneas killed two champions of the danans crethon and orsilicus their father was a rich man who lived in the strong city of fair and was descended from the river alpheus whose broad stream flows through the land of the pylians the river begat orsilicus who ruled over much people and was father to diocles who in his turn begat twin sons crethon and orsilicus well skilled in all the arts of war these were the, when they grew up went to ilius with the argive fleet in the cause of menelaus and agamemnon son of atreus and there they both of them fell as two lions whom their dam had reared in the depths of some mountain forest to plunder homesteads and carry off sheep and cattle till they got killed by the hand of man so were these two vanquished by the aeneas and fell like high pine trees to the ground brave Menelaus pitted them in their fall and made his way to the front clad clad in gleaming bronze and brandishing his spear for mars egged him on to do so with intent that he should be killed by aeneas but antilochus son of nestor saw him and sprang forward fearing that the king might come to harm and thus bring all their labor to nothing when therefore aeneas and menelaus were sitting their hands and spears against one another eager to do battle 
Antilochus placed himself by the side of Menelaus. Aeneas, bold though he was, drew back on seeing the two heroes side by side in front of him. So they drew the bodies of Phaethon and Arschelos to the ranks of the Achaeans and committed the two poor fellows into the hands of their comrades. They then turned back and fought in the front ranks. They killed Palamius, peer of Mars, leader of the Paphogonian warriors. Menelaus struck him in the collarbone as he was standing with his chariot, while Antilochus hit his charioteer and squire Maiden, the son of Atimnius, who was turning his horses in flight. He hit him with a stone upon the elbow, and the reins, enriched with white ivory, fell from his hands into the dust. Antilochus rushed towards him and struck him in the temple with his sword, whereupon he fell headfirst from the chariot to the ground. There he stood for a while, with his head and shoulders buried deep in the dust, for he had fallen on sandy soil till his horses kicked him and laid him flat on the ground, as Antilochus lashed them and drove them off to the host of the Achaeans. But Hector marked them from across the ranks, and with a loud cry rushed towards them, followed by the strong battalion of the Trojans. Mars and dread Enyo led them on, she fraught with loose, ruthless turmoil of battle, while Mars wielded a monstrous spear and went about, now in front of Hector and now behind him. Diomed shook with passion as he saw them. As a man crossing a wide plain is dismayed to find himself on the brink of some great river rolling swiftly to the sea, he sees its boiling water and stirs back in fear. Even so did the son of Tydeus give ground. Then he said to his men, My friends, how can we wonder that Hector wields the spear so well? Some god is ever by his side to protect him, and now Mars is with him in the likeness of mortal men. Keep your faces, therefore, towards the Trojans, and give ground backwards, for we dare not fight with gods. As he spoke, the Trojans drew close up, and Hector killed two men, both in one chariot, Menesthesis and Achirilus, heroes well versed in war. Ajax, son of Telamon, pitied them in their fall. He came close up and hurled his spear, hitting Amphius, the son of Salagus, a man of great wealth, who lived in Paces, and owned much corn-growing land, but his lot had led him to come to the aid of Priam and his sons. Ajax struck him in the belt. The spear pierced the lower part of his belly, and he fell heavily to the ground. <coughs> Ow. Then Ajax ran toward him to strip him of his armor. But the Trojans rained spears upon him, many of which fell upon his shoulder. He planted his heel upon the body and drew out his spear, but the darts pressed so heavily upon him that he could not strip the goodly armor from his shoulders. The Trojan chieftain, moreover, many and valiant, came about him with their spears, so that he dared not stay. Great, brave, and valiant though he was, they drove him from them, and he was beaten back. <coughs> it is hydration time. Oh. How long is this chapter? There is no end in sight. Okay. Where were we? There we are. <coughs> Thus then did the battle rage between them. Presently, the strong hand of fate impelled Tlepolemus, the son of Hercules, a man both brave and of great stature, to fight Sarpedon. So the two, son and grandson of great Jove, drew near to one another, and Tlepolemus spoke first. Sarpedon, said he, counselor of the Lycians, why should you come skulking here, you who are a man of peace? They lie who call you, you son of Aegis-bearing Jove, for you are little like those who were of old his children. Far other was Hercules, my own brave and lion-hearted father, 
who came here for the forces of Laomedon. And though he had six ships only, and few men to follow him, sacked the city of Ilius and made a wilderness of their highways. You are a coward, and your people are falling from you. For all your strength and all your coming from Lycia, you will be no help to the Trojans, but will pass the gates of Hades, vanquished by my hand. And Sarpedon, captain of the Lycians, answered, Clipolemus, your father overthrew Ilias by reason of Lamedon's folly, refusing payment to one who had served him well. <coughs> which would not give your father the horses, which he had come so far to fetch. As for yourself, you shall meet death by my spear. You shall yield glory to myself and your son, soul to Hades, for the noble steeds. Uh, okay. Thus spoke Sarpedon, and Thelominus upraised his spear. They threw at the same moment, and Sarpedon struck his foe in the middle of his throat. The spear went thrice through, and the darkness of death fell upon his eyes. Th Thliponius's spear struck Sarpedon in the left thigh with such force that it tore through the flesh and grazed the bone, but his father as yet warded off destruction from him. Okay. Meanwhile, the Argives were neither driven towards their ships by Mars and Hector, nor yet did they attack them. When they knew that Mars was with the Trojans, they retreated, but kept their faces still turned towards the foe. <coughs> who then was first and who last to be slain by Mars and Hector? They were valiant Tenthus and Orestes, the renowned charioteer, Trachus, the Aetolian warrior, Onemenus, Helenus, the son of Anipus, and Orispus, the gleaming girdle, who was possessed of great wealth and dwelt by the Cespian Lake with the other Boeotians who lived near him, owners of a fertile country. Now when the goddess Juno saw the Argives thus falling, she said to Minerva, <coughs> Alas, daughter of Aegis-bearing Jove, unweariable, the promise we made Menelaus that he should not return till he had sacked the city of Ilius will be of no effect if we let Mars rage thus furiously. Let us go into the fray at once. Minerva did not gainsay her. Therian, the august goddess, daughter of great Saturn, began to harness the gold-bedazzled steed. Hebe, with all speed, fitted on the eight-spoked wheels of bronze that were on either side of the iron axle tree. The fellows of the wheels were of gold, imperishable, and over those there was a tire of bronze wondrous to behold. The naves of the wheel were silver, turning round the axle upon either side. The car itself was made with plated bands of gold and silver, and it had a double top rail running all round it. From the body of the car there were a pole of silver onto the end which she bound the golden yoke with the bands of gold that were to go under the necks of the horses. <clears throat> then Juno put her steeds under the yoke, eager for battle and the war cry. Meanwhile, Minerva flung her richly embroidered vesture made with her own hands onto her father's threshold and donned the shirt of Jove, arming herself for battle. She threw her tasseled aegis about her shoulders, wreathed round with rout as with a fringe <coughs> and on it were strife and strength and panic whose blood runs cold. Moreover, there was the head of the dread monster Gorgon, grim and awful to behold, portent of Aegis bearing Jove. On her head, she set her helmet of gold with four plumes and coming to a peak both in front and behind, decked with the emblems of a hundred cities. Then she stepped into her flaming chariot and grasped the spear so stout and sturdy and strong, with which she quells the ranks of heroes who have displeased her. Juno lashed the horses on, and the gates of heaven be bellowed as they flew open of their own accord, gates over which the horse pres ho hours preside, 
in whose hands are heaven and Olympus, either to open the dense cloud that hides them or to close it. Through these, the goddesses drove their obedient steeds and found the son of Saturn sitting all alone on the topmost ridges of Olympus. There, Juno stayed her horses and spoke to Jove, the son of Saturn, lord of all. Father Jove, said she, are you not angry with Mars for these high doings? How great and godly a host of the Achaeans he has destroyed to my great grief, and without either right or reason, while the Cyprian and the Apollo are enjoying it all at their ease and setting this unrighteous madman on to do further mischief. I hope, Father Jove, that you will not be angry if I hit Mars hard and chase him out of the battle. And Jove answered, set Minerva on to him, for she punishes him more often than anyone else does. Juno did as he had said. She lashed her horses and they flew forward, nothing loth midway betwixt earth and sky. As far as a man can see when he looks out upon the sea from some high beacon, so far can the loud neighing horses of the gods spring at a single bound. Okay. I need to stop. Even though we did not finish the chapter, we will have to finish the chapter later, which I think is okay. We will we will do so later, but um I have to go make dinner. I just realized we have absolutely hit five o'clock. Um, so <clears throat> let me see who is around. I think Storm's around, but he is. We're going to go raid him because he's cool. He's playing Sims and um, it'll be all good. And, <clears throat> you know, we got a good chunk of of spinning done. We'll get more done later. I didn't remember to move my keyboard, but um, yeah, off we go.